Magic squares are those things so commonly known in occultism, used by many beginners, but frankly seem really unrelated to the subject overall. Let's wonder for a moment, what does a box of numbers have to do with anything? I mean, why even use it in sigil construction or the like? It isn't actually connected to anything, it isn't intrinsically mystical, right? Well, actually this is the point where sometime in history man made mathematics a divine thing. As he often does. I mean, Math isn't really created, right? The interrelations of the subjects of mathematics are pre-existent. Like, apples and trees have amounts already, we just categorize them or display them through hieroglyphic symbols called numbers. But that scenario still existed as it was, the math didn't really make the apples or trees. I bring this up because once upon a time, math and nature were believed so intrinsically intertwined that ultimately patterns, organic growth, among whatever else your heart fancies, had some relevance to the spiritual matters of occult minds, or mystic thinkers. Like, in the early mind there weren't two sexes simply because there were. No, to those people, the divine had something to say about that number we call two or the divine had something to say about how many leaves a certain plant has, which is common to early theology. You get the point. All these ideas would eventually form a sought after numerical perfection, and likely Sudoku, but that perfection was rooted in patterns. It was based in the idea of harmony, meaning that nothing would be out of balance. Rather, all the pieces would be put right in their place. The Eastern minds would one day classify this as the chart, if you will, of all energetic flow. Not like electrical or anything, but some obscure spiritual energy. To the Semitic minds we would find Mazal, literally the flow, by which things were known by certain cyclical relationships, be it in the sky or on the ground, celestial movements or seasons of planting. I mean, hell, astrology is actually just a series of numbers based on these same movements at the end of the day. All these things came together and would set the stage for Western occultism as we know it. With all that being said, my name is River, and welcome to the Nimaton. So what's so special about these squares called magic squares? There's a few things. And if you're watching this video, you likely already know the basics. But for newcomers, magic squares are a square. If not multiple squares inside another main piece, think of a tic-tac-toe grid that has one number in each section. The numbers start at one and go up until all the spaces are filled. Three conditions have to be met to make it a magic square though. All rows, all columns, and diagonals of equal length have to add up to the same exact number. The squares themselves, and the smaller squares inside, will also be equivalently distributed. But where's the magic? It's in the correspondences. What I mean is that the usages are tied to various subjects of interest. Remember how this all dealt with the flow of things? Well, the main item of analysis has been celestial movements, so it only makes sense that these squares would be ascribed to one of the seven antiquated celestial bodies. These bodies are further and have always been tied to seasons, hours of the day, phases of the moon, and like references. You know, some people aren't actually all that aware of how timing relates to magical practices. But even in spaces like the Kabbalah, we find that study between midnight and 1am to be very significant. Or how about how there is a holy day in the week for the Abrahamic faiths, and a variety of others. Or even in Nordic culture, the days of the week themselves adopted names of the deities they worshipped. Time has been significant to humans since, well since time was noted in the minds of those early people. Time for time immemorial. Surprisingly though, the real magic concept is all in that flow. It's in the numbers themselves, or 
It's more so in a belief about proportions and relationships in early numerology. The adding up of rows and columns being equivalent caused the belief that all these items were following a rule of being. The early thinkers didn't really care exactly what number was shown, but that the pattern formed as it did and in their eyes represented an intrinsic nature of those higher matters, of those planets, or in sound. In fact, this mentality is still so grabbing to the human mind we saw an explosion of 369 Nikola Tesla stuff a few years ago trying to claim infinite energy machines were soon to exist through insights of numerically nested torus wheels. You know, guys like Marco Rodin. We can take a simple look to that famous quote ascribed to Pythagoras and see the belief very clearly. It said, There is geometry in the humming of the strings. There is music in the spacing of the spheres. Conceptually, this is supposing that the equivalences, the balance of something like geometry and the presence of sounds and the medium by which they are produced, share a similitude of effects and cause, even though seen and perceived in very different ways. It's what early minds might have called the harmony of the universe, because no one thing was exclusively separate from it in their world. Nothing really broke a law. And if it did so unexplainably, it was a miracle. Yet, we aren't here to discuss miracles. The idea of magic squares is that by utilizing the foundations of this chart, taking note from the Eastern style, by following the patterns of these numbers, a person impresses or presents a force upon that flow the patterns depict and represent, whereby the course of normalcy shifts itself into a desired state or at least a particular desired effect occurs. It all starts with the will though, which is one of the main arguments for why people say it works at all. This is also one of the various points at which occult traditions split paths and styles. Let's show off three mentalities through a question. Does the image of a sigil have force of its own without your involvement? In the plain approach, it does which is similar to how we relay the ideas of goetic sigils. In the other approach, it does not, and is strictly will, so who even cares what it looks like? And then in the middle ground, we'll find a scene in which the will and emotive investment is like a charge to the implement. Yet at the same time, specificity of design plays the role of engaging one's own psycho-spiritual aspects and components. Like it gets your head in the game. I think it'd be fair now to take a closer look at the magic squares as they relate to various correspondences. The only immediate connection in the antiquated style is that energetic movement, like a thumbprint of natural law and barrier, which is the more eastern touch. But in the western mind, we see the earlier points tied to the celestial bodies, specifically the seven spheres of antiquity, which are the sun and moon out to Saturn. Now, I've been asked quite a few times, why did the ancients stop at Saturn? Is it the evil black cube worshipping Cabal I've heard so much about? Or that Mesopotamian second sun thing? No. No, absolutely not. Saturn is the last conveniently seeable planet using only the human eye. In very, very good conditions, you can catch Uranus. But it's right on the brink. So as simple as it is, that's actually the main reason why it stopped at Saturn. Another reason is also numerological though. Saturn is the sixth sphere from the sun, but with the inclusion of the moon as a celestial body, it would appear a seventh. Noting that in early days, the moon and sun were tied in a greater human mythos, along with seven holding varying ideas of supernal and spiritual significance in the flow of time. With the idea of cyclical experience and the celestial bodies moving in mathematically predictable patterns, an idea arose that those spheres played a role in the determining experiences, or we may call them seasons of being. However, aside from the seers who thought to predict worldly events and occurrences, what I mean is that 
The human experience has seasons much as the world experiences seasons, which were charted in some way through the movement of those bodies. Nowadays we tend to call this astrology, but at a time there was a point in which this was very readily accepted, because man was much like everything else on the planet, just distinctly separated by his level of awareness. However, aside from the seers who thought to predict worldly events and occurrences, the fortune tellers, if you will, another purpose arose through the forces of text. Let's take Hebrew, for example, which has its internal relationship to gematria. Because the letters represent also numbers, they're not separate from each other. Thus, utilizing the number chart allowed the imprinting process to incorporate the written word without disconnect. This is one of the early connections that would precursor the Western magic mentality on phrases and sigil construction. We would later see this used in English through Cornelius Agrippa. Yet at this point, a new possibility reveals itself. Not only can you go from letter to number to sigil, you can go in reverse, as seen in things like the pig pen cipher. Beyond that, the letters being long seen as a creative agent in the universe are not only tied to the flow of the numerical patterns, but it is thought that to some extent their essence is tied into the flow further, thereby imprinting them in some higher space, which is that energetic lattice by which all things are subject to. So you might ask, is there anything to really be learned from magic squares aside from all this general occult stuff? Actually, yes. The most simple magic square, which isn't really treated as a magic square, is simply the number one. One fits all the general rules of the magic square without itself being usable as one, which would be treated as one of the points of monocentric expression, or an argument for a oneness of the universe from which everything else expands and expresses itself from, similar to the part Sufim talk in our Kabbalah creation from Ain to Earth video. With all that, I hope there's a little stronger of a philosophy tied to general magic squares, their usages, and your idea on them. And anyways, this has been River at the Nimiton, and I hope you've enjoyed this basic look on the squares, numerology, and occult opinions. A massive thank you to all my friends, patrons, and supporters. I appreciate you more than you know.